Hi, I'm Mike Hartman with Waco Aircraft Corporation. Welcome to Oshkosh. We've got a treat for you today. This is the Yonkers F-13. Now, this is a replica aircraft that was built. Currently, there's only two of these flying in the world, one here in the United States and one in Switzerland. There's also one also being built as we speak, so there will be three flying examples. The Yonkers F-13 was built in 1919, and it was the first all-metal commercial aircraft. As a matter of fact, it's 103 years old, but 100 years ago, on June 1st, this aircraft flew the first line flight with Swiss Air. So this aircraft kind of mustered us into the modern airline revolution. Come on in a little bit closer. We're just going to start down here at the landing gear. Very big beefy gear. We've made some adjustments to it where the angle on the gear is a little more out forward and that helps us balance a little more when we're landing. Big struts and these wheels and brakes are actually what you'd see on a T6 tech so they're red line brakes and we've got T6 wheels, same tire size. Underneath the airplane you can see our whole center section down there is very flat and you can see that famous corrugation which will look familiar to some people. If you're not familiar with Yonkers, you're familiar with the Ford Trimotor and we definitely have that corrugation. This is the aircraft all of that came from. The brakes are very effective on the airplane, so we got to be a little careful when we get into them. Brakes are pretty much for emergencies and run-ups. We start looking at our wing here. There's the corrugation I was telling you about. A lot of people ask what this hump is right here. Much like a T6 Texan, this is where our wings attach, so that's kind of a wing attach angle. And this is just a fairing that's covering up all the nuts and bolts that attach those wings together to the airplane. The inside of the wing doesn't really have a front and rear spar that we're used to. Think of when you're seeing a skyscraper being built. It's kind of what the inside of the wing looks like. Long tubular attached by framing. Okay, so it is a very strong wing. The corrugation makes it a little bit stronger too. Another question I get is, does it make a difference in aerodynamics? To be honest with you, in the airplane, I can't tell a difference. Okay, <laughs> so. Looking under the wing, these are counterbalances. These are something that were added later on, okay? Make the ailerons feel better. There's no aileron flutter. So these are just counterbalances. Another question we get asked a lot. So those were added on to the airplane. Standing here, you could tell how thick that wing is, how long that wing is. I'm six foot and I can lay straight across that and have a lot of room to spare. Moving to the ailerons, pretty standard. Three hinges on the aileron, once again corrugated. The aircraft flies with heavier ailerons. It's a very stable airplane in the air. Actually handles turbulence pretty well. We'll go over some speeds once we get up to the cockpit. The aircraft is registered experimental currently because it is a reproduction aircraft. So, being a replica, it's under experimental category. Oshkosh is the first distance flight we took in this airplane in the United States. Hasn't been here very long. We've been flying since about June here. It was flying a lot in Switzerland previously. We've got wood that runs through the corrugations. This just gives us a little more walkway to step on so we're not stepping in the corrugations. We've got that nice wood there and some steps added on so we can climb up into the aircraft and we're going to get inside of it here in a little bit. Fuselage of the airplane, very flat, slab sided. So what does that say when we're landing? As with any airplane, it's best to be into the wind, right? But this aircraft in a crosswind can be a little difficult because we've got all that surface area. It's got a 12 knot maximum crosswind component, but we like to keep it around eight or nine if we can. But into the wind is always the best, right? <laughs> Back here's our tail. Same corrugation that we're seeing throughout the airplane, right? So our horizontal stabilizer, strut braced, and of course our tail wheel back there. 
A lot of questions we get, is it a free swiveling tailwheel? Is it a locking tailwheel? Does it steer? Well, it does two of those things. It swivels like a shopping cart wheel, and it also locks straight back. Takeoff and landing, once we're rolling straight on takeoff, we lock that tailwheel. That helps us stay a little more stable. The airplane has a very light elevator, so a little heavier on the ailerons and light on the elevator. It's got a really nice feel to it. Well, another question we get that I'll answer, especially for all you tailwheel people out there, is how do we land the airplane? Do we wheel land it? Do we three-point land it? I usually don't get into that religion too much. I say it's based on the aircraft. This airplane, we always three-point the airplane. One of the reasons is because that rudder there, right now, as the airplane sits, is blanked out by the fuselage and the lower wing. So we don't have a lot of rudder control once the airplane gets going slower. So we prefer to have that tail on the ground with that locking tail wheel, and that helps us drive the airplane straight. We have wheel landed it, and as everybody knows, or, or you aviators know, when the tail's up, everything's honky-dory, it's fine. When that tail starts coming down to that transition point, we're blanking out that rudder. And if it starts to get a little weebly-wobbly, then we got to use a little bit of brake to keep her straight. So three-point is your answer on that one. Over on this side of the aircraft, much the same, we've got steps on this side so the other pilot and the other passengers can get in. The pilots do sit out in the open and the passengers sit in the back in comfort. Of course, back in the old days, most pilots were out in the air anyway, so maybe they just figured we like that sort of thing. Over here, pitot tube, pretty straightforward. That's where our airspeed comes from, right? You can get a really good shot underneath the wing. Now, it's probably a little bit dark, but how big that wing is. Very long wing cord. And also the thickness of the wing. So, you may look at the airplane and think, well, it's very draggy, it's not gonna fly that well. One of the biggest surprises about this airplane doing the test flights and flying this aircraft is, when you pull the power back to land, it actually does glide a little bit. So our biplanes and other aircraft, they come down a lot quicker. But surprisingly enough, this airplane does glide a little bit, which is really nice. So contrary to its looks, it's actually a great flying aircraft. This is a Hamilton Standard ground adjustable prop built by MT Propellers. Very shiny, very polished. So what we could do with this, since it's ground adjustable, so we can, as opposed to a constant speed or adjustable prop from the cockpit, we adjust it from out here. Some bolts that we loosen up, we can adjust that blade angle, okay? So overseas, you have noise, um, noise ordinances. So you're gonna want that prop pitched a little more that keeps the noise level down. If we need more RPM, we can pitch it a little bit flatter, spin the engine up a little more. Of course, then you got a lot more noise with the engine. This engine here is an R985. It's made by Pratt and Whitney. This is a Covington aircraft engine, so totally redone by Covington. And it's 450 horsepower. Going back to the prop, the way it's pitched right now, we're getting about 380 horsepower out of the engine. It's a nine cylinder radial engine. We're getting about 20 gallons per hour on cross country flying. It does have a blower in it, so it is supercharged, but with a fixed pitch prop, we're really not noticing that too much, okay? As opposed to having a constant speed propeller. These airplanes had many different engines over the years. The first models would have had a wooden prop. They had an inline water-cooled engine. Over the years, many of these were produced and they were re-engined with many, many, many different engines. Later in its service life, the Pratt and Whitney actually was on a few F-13s. 
The reason the Pratt & Whitney is on there today is because it's a very reliable engine, gives us the power we need. We know when we push the throttle forward, it's going to go. Also, maintenance-wise, these engines are great with maintenance, parts availability, and if we need something, we can just call and get it ordered. So, our 985 nine-cylinder Pratt & Whitney radial engine, 450, we've got it about 380 right now. So here we are standing on top of the wing of the airplane. Beautiful wing. Never ceases to amaze me when I'm flying the airplane looking out over that wing. It's kind of a neat, uh, neat wing profile. So here is where the passengers sit. This is where you ride in comfort in the F-13. And as I was saying before, this was the first commercial all-metal aircraft, right? So here is airline seating back in the day, okay? Remember, this is a 103-year-old airplane, and 100 years ago was its first line flight with Swiss Air. And you can see inside it still looks pretty good. It's comfortable. Even by modern standards, today the F-13 was a comfortable ride. You can fit four people pretty comfortably back there. It's what we call club seating nowadays. And we have leather in there. There's plenty of leg room. Even a big guy like me could sit back there. And riding in comfort. All right, so here we go. Going to show you how to get into the Yonkers F-13. No, we don't get in through the back. There's no door there. So we got to go in and over the top. One of the handy dandy things also that's in this aircraft, and you'll see it in older biplanes and some of our Waco aircraft out here, is a kick step. So it's just a hinged piece of metal with a step on the inside. So what I'm going to do is put my foot in the kick step and kind of brace myself and then all at once hop myself up onto the top of the cockpit. What I like to do is put my hands in there, just hop right down onto the seat. Once that happens and I can shimmy myself down into the cockpit and now I'm in the office. One of the questions that we also hear a lot, I keep bringing those up because we get a lot of them, is is it windy inside of this cockpit? The answer is no. This windscreen's actually very effective. We don't get very much wind at all. Now up here, there may be a little bit of a buffet, maybe a little suction zone, but it's not bad at all. So contrary to popular belief, we don't feel a lot of wind inside of the cockpit, and it's very comfortable in here because we're sitting down pretty low, so it works out real nice. Behind me over here, we've got these handy headset hangers. Usually we wear a leather or cloth flight helmet with David Clark headsets or, or any other type of headset that we can wear in here. Noise canceling doesn't work that great, but it does work good because it is kind of a noisy environment. Here's all of our switches. <clears throat> Avionics, gyros, my fuel pump switches are here. We use those for takeoff and landing. Our beacon switch, we always leave that on just in case we forget the master switch. Alternator, here's our master. My mag switches are right here, so we don't have a key or a normal switch like you'd think of. It's just two flip-flop switches, Magneto 1, Magneto 2, and our starter switch. Down here, going along with electrics, are all my circuit breakers. So that pretty much handles the electric portion of the aircraft. Not very much there, pretty simple, and everything's very accessible right here where I need it. So when we're going through the checklists, I got everything right here. Inside of the cockpit, on both sides we have a standard six-pack on each side, the pilot and co-pilot side with the airspeed altimeter and everything else that you're used to seeing in any other aircraft. Got a Garmin G5 here, and we have some engine analyzation here, but we also back that up with the steam gauges. I find myself usually looking at the gauges because I like looking at that needle. It's a quick reference. Onto the throttle quadrant down here, there's a few extra levers and some people aren't used to seeing, but nothing really too bad. You got your throttle, your mixture, and you have your 
oil cooler door here. So when the engine's cold, we close that oil cooler, prevents airflow through going into the oil cooler. We can warm that oil up a lot quicker. And on cold days, you'll see us flying around with the oil cooler closed so we can keep that oil up to operating temperature and warm. Right now, we'll leave it on. Down here, this knob is our carburetor heat. So we pull it up for on and down for off. Mixture, primer. Below all of this on the throttle quadrant is our fuel selector. We have a left, a right, and a both. Currently, it's in the off position. Down between the seats, down here, this wheel right here, this big wood wheel, that's my trim. My gauge for my trim is up on the panel right here. Take off, nose down, nose up, and one final little lever down here that's kind of an important one is our tailwheel lock. When it's back, the tailwheel is free. When it's forward, it's locked. Like I said, once we pull onto the runway and we get the airplane rolling straight, I'll lock that tailwheel so it's straight back and that'll help us. For taxiing, I unlock it. I love the yokes on this aircraft. They're not big wheels. They're just kind of like batwing style wheels, wood grips. And if you look at the co-pilots, yoke, you can actually see those cables with a turnbuckle. So those are the actual workings that you can see happening when we're turning the aileron of the aircraft. So you can actually see those cables. The rudder pedals are mounted to a pipe and they're just kind of hinged there with the brake on top of the pedal. I hope you guys enjoyed looking at this F-13 as much as I have. It's out here so we can share it with you. If you have any questions, feel free to come by the booth. That's Waco Aircraft Corporation and ask any question you want. We'll be here.